Ladies and gentlemen, our world is one of change and upheaval. In the midst of such upheavals, things fall apart. The upheavals may themselves be an undeniable good, including the revolutionary overthrow of despotic monarchs in Europe or of racist colonialism in Africa, but the change itself may result in destructive tendencies and even civil wars. Listen to Yeats as he says, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Or things may even slide into chaos and civil war, as we have seen in Syria, as we saw in Lebanon a generation ago, and as the whole world lived through in the past and especially in the 20th century, when the scale of destruction and annihilation reached an unsurpassed crescendo. Then the warnings of the bard were particularly prescient, when he gives us this horrible image of war, death and destruction. Blood and destruction shall be so in use, and dreadful objects so familiar, that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants quartered with the hands of war, all pity choked with the custom of fell deeds. Horrors so unimaginable that only the numbness of familiarity will enable us to endure them, the custom of fell deeds shall choke out even the pity of mothers watching their children die. Cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war, that this foul deed shall smell above the earth with carrion men groaning for burial. Carrion men groaning for burial? Who could have imagined the horrors of the Holocaust, the killing fields from the Somme and Verdun in World War I to the wholesale slaughter of World War II, to the massacres of Cambodia, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, and beyond. Only the language of literature can cope with such a challenge. Only the language of literature can allow us to bear witness, marshal our moral outrage, and in the immortal phrase of Yeats, to hold in a single thought reality and justice. So, turning to literature when confronted with social challenges in our own times, it is not difficult to find both insight and wisdom from the past that feeds our needs in the present. One of those things we get from reflecting on the past and its inheritance is the need for understanding change and leadership. We yearn for a clear vision and a firm hand. But we want to be guided, not ruled. We need to be convinced, not forced. We need to be inspired, not intimidated. We want leadership, not administration. Leaders stand out from the crowd, and we all recognize their greatness. But what makes a leader? As Shakespeare says, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. What motivates leaders? What are the burdens that such leaders must bear? Now that is my theme today. And to address this theme as it appears in the works of Shakespeare, I would like to make a few propositions about the burdens of leadership and show that Shakespeare addressed each and every one of them in interesting ways. First, power. Generally speaking, leaders must seek and exercise powers in ways that are consonant with a system of values, not through absolute tyranny. Ultimately, human values insist on respect for human dignity and reject negative things from torture to mendacity. Second, justice. Now, justice is not only 
to enforce the law equally, but also to ensure that the law itself is fair to all. This means that legalism without justice is not an exercise in leadership. And in more subtle ways, that the exclusion of minorities and discrimination against them is inherently unjust. And that gender equality and justice towards women is an essential part of any conception of social justice. Third, responsibility. Leaders must take responsibility for their actions and shall be judged accordingly. Those who are in a position of leadership and try to evade their responsibilities will ultimately lead their societies to disastrous results. But reality is that every le leader deals with these three main topics in many different ways, succeeding in some and failing in others. People are never perfect. So how does Shakespeare deal with the humanity of the leader, not just the humanity of the led? In Shakespeare's times, leadership was usually reserved for kings and nobles and the powerful church. Religious and secular power had been intertwined. England had been subjected to its share of problematic rulers, popular rebellions and civil wars, notably the Wars of the Roses. Parliament was still embryonic and the revolution against Charles I was still to come. Even discussion of the possible limits of the divine right of kings beyond the limited framework of the Magna Carta was considered seditious. So how did the Bard address the issue of leadership? Its burdens and its woes, its successes and its failures, its ethical responsibilities and its involvement with the people. Shakespeare painted on the canvas of history. Many of his most powerful plays are the history's plays. Historical plays treating of the kings of England and how they exercised power and how they met the burden of leadership. When he took historical events and characters as the basis of his plays, he still constructed complex characters that defied the popular myths surrounding them in both the historical record and in the popular imagination. Invariably, such myths tend to be unidimensional and stilted, all good or all bad. Thus, Henry V is the conquering hero who defeats the French at Agincourt and wins the throne of France for his son. Yet, Shakespeare shows him committing war crimes, yes, war crimes, and casts doubt about both the integrity of his motives and the value of his achievements. Richard III is the murderous hunchback who has the princes killed in the tower and who schemes and plots his ways to the throne of England until he is undone. While the murder of the two princes in the tower may or may not be laid at his door, there is no doubt that he was on the whole a villain of the first order. Yet Shakespeare endows him with a surprising eloquence. Richard II is a difficult character who is generally seen as a failure, yet Shakespeare endows him with the soul of a poet. It is this multi-layered reality of Shakespeare's work that intrigues us to this day. It is the ambiguity, so human, that the supreme craftsman injects into his plays and his characters that have helped his work transcend space and time. So let us now look at those three aspects of leadership one at a time, starting with the issue of power and ethical values. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So said Lord Acton. How true. To look at the path to power, we find many who are corrupted just by their lust for it. Here we could usefully discuss Julius Caesar and Richard III. But I would rather look at a few passages from Macbeth. Indeed, for such times as ours, the particular message of Macbeth has special relevance. We need to be reminded of its basic theme that selfish egotism 
shorn of any redeeming value, will destroy all that it touches. Macbeth is encapsulated in this famous line, for mine own good all causes shall give way. This is but a more elegant formulation of the commonly heard views in today's society. Me first. What's in it for me? Look out for number one or every man for himself or the Egyptian colloquialism, that which you win with, play with. It is the same loss of spiritual content and moral compass that was powerfully captured by the culture of greed in the 1980s and again at the time of the great crash of 2007-2008. Such a credo, Shakespeare shows us, results in nothingness and leaves one empty, shallow and wandering. Listen to the powerful speech he gives Macbeth at the end of the play. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps at this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player who frets and struts his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Tis a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. But even in Macbeth, Shakespeare never gives us just cartoon characters. And this play too has its multiplicity of layers and subplots, but that is a discussion for another day. Let us go back that in the pursuit of power, ethics is central. Not all avenues are acceptable to reach power. And to maintain himself or herself in power, a leader is not justified in employing any means possible. Frequently, ideological claims for the unity of the nation or the unity of the country or the unity of the religious community requiring the sacrifice of the individual for the benefit of the nation, which of course the leader says that he embodies and defines. No, ethical values must guide the actions of the leader. The ends do not justify the means. It's interesting to read Franz Kafka's The Trial for the terrible atmosphere that prevailed in totalitarian regimes in Eastern Europe. And Arthur Kessler's powerful indictment of the Moscow trials of the 1930s called Darkness at Noon remains pertinent to this day and also shows that totalitarian ideology is the same, whether it is applied by atheistic communists or by religious zealots as he quotes in his epigraph where you could substitute state or nation or party for the word church. In the opening sentence of that epigraph, when the existence of the church is threatened, she is released from the commandments of morality. With unity as the end, the use of every means is sanctified, even cunning, treachery, violence, simony, prison, death. For all order is for the sake of the community and the individual must be sacrificed to the common good. Thus spoke the Bishop of Verden in 1411 AD. Doesn't matter who said it. All totalitarian regimes have subverted some values such as patriotism, sense of wanting to defend the community to justify excesses such as torture. Now Shakespeare attacks that problem head on in one of the most powerful scenes ever written, especially when you consider the social context of his time. I mean the torture scene in King Lear. In a magisterial exposition of that scene, Greenblatt shows how sadistic rulers, using collaboration with the enemy as an excuse, want to torture a political enemy. And how the act is shown stripped of its legalistic coverings and so injurious is it to everyone's sense of decency? Is it that a servant attacks a duke and the political rationale is set aside 
by our obvious sense of a common humanity. So let's review the scene in some detail guided by Stephen Greenblatt. In a remarkable and profound discussion of the torture scene of King Lear, Greenblatt shows how completely and effectively Shakespeare denounces the practice of torture and how completely and effectively he destroys any instrumental argument in his favor. Although the religious war of Catholicism and Protestantism were rampant in the Europe of his time, his powerful dramatic scenes served to reject torture and to challenge the authority of those who would use it. Now, the relevance of this is obvious. Whether we are discussing the Lord's Army in Uganda, uh, waterboarding in USA prisons, or the more immediate and cruel forms of torture elsewhere in the world. In the treatment he gives it in King Lear, Shakespeare contrived to represent the practice of torture in such a way as to make it utterly recognizable. The urgent questioning of someone who has been caught conniving with a foreign power to topple the established regime. But Shakespeare also makes it utterly unacceptable. Now, he did so by collapsing the hygienic distance that separates the monarch and the privy councillors cloaked in the mantle of moral authority from the vicious and sadistic underlings who carried out their orders. Torture in King Lear is conducted directly by the rulers, Cornwall and Regan, who are depicted as reptilian monsters. Moreover, Shakespeare subtly uncoupled the infliction of torture from the search for information and hence undermined any simple instrumental rationale. So before Cornwall even gets his hands on the high-born traitor, he declares his intention to injure him, quite apart from the outcome of the process of interrogation. Though well, we may not pass upon his life without the form of justice, yet our power shall do a courtesy to our wrath, which men may blame but not control. That's particularly horrible and familiar about this declaration is its nauseating blend of legalism, sadism, and public relations as if Cornwall is already thinking about how he will excuse the fact that there were certain regrettable excesses in his otherwise legal treatment of the prisoner, the traitor. Ah, I was angry. I couldn't control myself. In a moment of anger, things happened. So the plucking out of the Earl of Gloucester's eyes seems to have appalled even the hardened Jacobean spectators of Shakespeare's time. And the language of the play cunningly anticipates the act so as to intensify its horror. This pattern of anticipation culminates in Gloucester's response to the repeated question, wherefore to Dover, because I would not see thy cruel nails pluck out his poor old eyes. Cornwall's response, see to it, shalt thou never, he says, gouging out the first of the prisoner's eyes. And this provokes a reaction that may for contemporary audience have been even more shocking than the act of torture. Now here, Shakespeare undertakes a bold and powerful development. It is not the aristocrats who are present that intervened to stop that monstrous torture. It is a nameless servant who steps forward and orders, please note, orders his master, his own master, to stop what he is doing. Hold your hand, my lord. I have served you ever since I was a child, but better service have never done you than now to bid you hold. The servants, masters, are astounded and then exclaim in disbelief, how now you dog, says Reagan, and Cornwall's my villain, both reflect incredulity at the fact that the servant is one of their own servants and not one of the servants from Gloucester's household where they are at the moment. And in the ensuing scuffle, Regan grabs a sword and stabs the underling in the back. A peasant stand up thus, but not before the peasant has fatally wounded the Duke. And here, the audience is manifestly invited 
to endorse this radical act, the murder of a ruler by a serving man who stands up for human decency. Now, Greenblatt underlines the importance of that dimension and rounds out the power of the scene by saying, though his act has important political consequences, the servant is not acting out of party allegiance and still less out of personal ambition. He has an ethically adequate object, the desire to serve the Duke, his master, by stopping him at all costs from performing a totally horrible and unworthy action. He does not seek power for himself, nor is there anything to indicate that he supports the French invaders, nor is there anything else that says that he has any political agenda. Now, his dying words to Gloucester, my lord, you have one eye left to see some mischief on him, i.e. to take revenge on Cornwall, suggests that in his last moments of life, the servant has shifted his allegiance from Cornwall to Cornwall's victim. And this attempt at further consolation only leads to further disaster as lest he sees more rages the mortally wounded Cornwall turning back to Gloucester, prevent it out vile jelly as he plucks out the other eye. Now, the ruler thus serves as an exemplar or test case. If he allows himself terrible actions and these actions go unpunished, then, to paraphrase Dostoevsky, everything is permitted. Now, Shakespeare was obviously conscious of this and wanted to denounce such actions, still very common by rulers in his time, and regretfully, still being practiced by some in the 21st century. Now, let us turn to justice. Justice is not legalism. Applying an unjust law may be legal, but it clearly demands redress. And it is the responsibility of true leaders to recognize where that is the case and where the need is for mercy to temper justice in a particular case or when the law itself needs to be changed. Now let me turn to the first argument and show how Shakespeare underlined that in his handling of the second act in Measure for Measure. The hypocritical Angelo, though authorized by the Duke to be merciful as well as just, declares himself a mere agent of the law. Tis the law, not I, who condemns your brother. She pleads for time. He replies that the law, having slept, is now awake, and had it always been so, it would have served as a deterrent. The law has not been dead, though it has slept those many had not dared to do that evil if the first that did the edict infringe had answered for his deed. Now it is awake. Take note of what is done. And like a prophet looks in a glass that shows what future evils, either now or by remissness, new conceived, and so in progress to be hatched and born, and now to have no successive degrees, but here they live to end. Now here, the function of judicial punishment is not so much deter as to abort future crime. The tone is steady and assured. Now, Isabella attacks the abuse of authority without denying its rights. Oh, it is excellent to have a giant strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. And as we know from that play and others, if justice is not tempered by mercy, it is not just. It is mere legalism. And here, of course, <laughs> I said justice and mercy. Here, of course, the most powerful of all speeches is delivered by another of Shakespeare's amazing women characters. It is Portia in The Merchant of Venice who says, The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. Blessed him that gives and him that takes. It is the mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes a throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty, wherein does sit the dread and fear of kings. But mercy 
is above this sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings. It is an attribute of God himself. And earthly power does then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. What more can anyone say? Well, we can say that today most of us would accept that discrimination against religious or ethnic and other minorities is not only wrong, it is, has to be completely unacceptable. Even if not legally sanctioned, discrimination is frequently socially enforced and practiced in subtle ways, but it is still wrong. And if you are a leader, you must strive to create a sense of inclusion in the community you govern. You should not allow discrimination to create excluded minorities. Being an outsider in a society of insiders will tend to undermine the social order and create tensions far beyond the usual differences of opinion and of interests that shall always create struggles within a society. But racism is different. It is irreconcilable. It leads to hatred that is irrational and is not based on any differences that can be mediated. It is inherently unjust. And Shakespeare was aware of the problem. And he gives us many powerful examples of that. And I'll draw upon some of the most famous plays and show how the conventional criticism has tended to avoid confronting the power of that message. Now, uh, back to the Merchant of Venice, the most famous of the cases is Shylock and anti-Semitism. The conventional perspective of the run of the play is that of a stereotypical caricature of the evil Jew trying to do harm to the Christians. But suddenly, a counter voice erupts in the play in one of the most powerful statements ever written in English, as Shylock says, Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is? If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? If you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why revenge? The villainy you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. Now, this speech that erupts into the play the full protesting voice of an irresistible egalitarian vision. We are all humans. The basis in shared faculties and needs of our common physical nature implicitly indicts all forms of inhuman discrimination. The speech provokes a radical shift of emotional allegiance from which our perception of the comedy, Christian protagonists, will never recover. And here I also agree with Ryan that the key line is the villainy you teach me I will execute. This is the definition of the rationale for Shylock's revenge. It is also the basis of so much of the endless actions by one community against another and the revenge and the cycle of action and reaction and violence continues sometimes leading to full-scale civil war. Now look around you in the world today and replace the word Jew and the word Christian with any oppressed and oppressor names and the timelessness of this plea comes through unimpaired. You can find many other passages in The Merchant of Venice that would repay this effort of trying to imagine the same text applied to another minority being discriminated against today. In fact, Stephen Greenblatt observes now, more than ever, the merchant of Venice has a weird, uneasy relevance, a sense at once fascinating and disagreeable that it is playing with fire. 
All my life, I thought of the combustible material as anti-Semitism, or to put it more carefully, Christianity's Jewish problem. Go, Tubal, and meet at our synagogue. Go, Tubal, at our synagogue, Tubal. But the queasiness of Western cities, says Greenblatt, no longer centers on the synagogue. It takes, as I hope I have shown, only a small adjustment to tap into current fears. Go, Tubal, and meet me at our mosque. Go, Tubal, at our mosque, Tubal. Greenblatt shows the relevance of this feeling of being an excluded minority in a society that refuses to accept you, whether you were Jewish in the Middle Ages or you are a, a Muslim today. The Merchant of Venice ends with the idea of a potentially happy ending if the Jews convert and disappear into society, assimilated into the Christian society. But is such an outcome possible? Is full assimilation ever an acceptable solution? Or is it better to think in terms of accepting pluralism? Now, Shakespeare was not blind to the real depth of the hatred that racism and bigotry can engender. And he treats both with stunning power in another famous play, Othello. Yes, Othello. Of all of Shakespeare's villains, Iago appears as the one who has no redeeming feature, whose hatred is absolute, and whose treachery and devious manipulation of Othello's weakness knows no bounds. And that is because he represents the absolute hatred that racist bigotry engenders. But Shakespeare doesn't give us cardboard characters. Othello, though noble, is flawed, and Iago does bring him down through his weakness of jealousy. But racism is at the heart of Iago's hatred, and it is the reason why the love of Othello and Desdemona is problematic. Othello is black and an outsider, that even though he is assimilated as the Moor of Venice and has saved the Venetian Republic by his military feats, is still not accepted in Venetian society. Even that aspect of the racism expressed in Iago's hatred is only one facet of the racist theme, a much more subtle one, and in my view, a much more important one, is the problem of the alienation of Othello himself from both himself and society. It is the lot of all migrants that have tried to integrate into a society that would not, in its heart of hearts, assimilate them or accept them as equals, no matter what their achievements have been. By their actions to integrate that alien society, they become collusive accomplices in their own self-denial. And they know it, even if they cannot easily accept it. Now, this is not a fanciful reading of contemporary problems into a centuries-old text, not at all. In a supreme dramatic achievement, grossly underrepresented in the critical literature, Shakespeare brings out the deeper cultural alienation at issue in the final suicide scene of Othello. Here is the main character of the play, about to commit suicide, turning to those around him, beseeching them to note his words carefully, and asking those responsible to report truthfully what has happened and why. Now, surely no speech could have been given a greater build-up by an author. And what does Othello say after all of these preparations? He concludes with these six lines. Set you down this and say besides that in Aleppo once were a malignant and turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and traduced the state, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. And at that point he stabs himself. This passage, after the build-up given it by Shakespeare, must give, be given special attention. And it repays that attention by giving what Ryan calls an elliptically compressed definition explanation of the whole tragedy of Othello. Now, this duality in the roles of Othello, one, the social role of the Moor of Venice, 
and the other being the innate person who has had to destroy itself to play the role of the Moor of Venice comes out in the peculiar reply that Othello, a few moments before killing himself, gives to Lodovico's question, where is this rash and most unfortunate man? Othello answers, there's he that was Othello, here I am. Aha, the separation is now clear. The rash and most unfortunate man is Othello, the Moor of Venice, while the wretched man inside, about to end his life, having lost all he cared for, has been liberated from the duality and the falsehood and finally acknowledges the terrible truth of the lie that he has lived. And he will tell it to those around him that they may record and report it truthfully to those who were not present to hear his last words. Now Shakespeare goes further and in some of his other writings likens those who would break the bonds that tie community and family together as vermin who chew and cut the bonds so necessary for society to function. In Lear, Kent wants to attack the evil Goneril's steward Oswald who has been told to insult the king. Prevented by Cornwall, he characterizes his opponent in words that apply to all the evil persons in the play and to many in anybody's acquaintance, including all of us here. Such smiling rogues as these, like rats, oft bite the holy cords at twain, which are the intrinsic to untloose. The figures of rats biting through the complicated knots that bind together families, friends, societies. They cannot be untied and thus are destroyed by the evil gnawing of the vermin. And it is the duty of leaders to hold societies together and therefore to recognize the vermin even though they smile at them and hypocritically give them praises. But what about women? Justice cannot be justice without gender equality. I believe that contrary to the view of Shakespeare as a patriarchal misogynist, Shakespeare shows great sensitivity to the issue of gender equality, especially given the context of his times. And he introduces it in the great plays where he treats exclusion of minorities. Now in Othello, true, the major theme is racism, but of course the complexity of Shakespeare's writing is that there are always sub-themes that come through and echo other aspects and uh, other dimensions. The theme is given voice by Emilia's long speech to Desdemona in the final scene of Act 4, dealing with the consequences of gender inequality and the injustice built into the marriage of their time. And she says, but I do think it is their husband's faults if wives do fall say that they slack their duties and pour our treasures into foreign laps or else break out in peevish jealousies throwing restraint upon us or say they strike us or scant our former having in despite why we have goals and though we have some grace yet have we some revenge let husbands know their wives have senses like them they see and smell and have their palates both for sweet and sour as husbands have and what is it they do when they change us for others? Is it sport? I think it is. And doth affection breed it? I think it doth. Isn't freightly and thus errs? It is so too. Have we not affections, desires for sport and frailty as men have? Then let them use us well. Else let them know the ills we do, their ill instructs us so. What an amazing echo, especially in that last line of the voice of the victim in Shylock's famous speech in The Merchant, especially his last line. And if we return to The Merchant, of course, the hero is Portia, who disguises herself as Balthazar to deliver uh, her famous court scene and the famous speech on mercy. And yet this same Portia, with all these innate abilities, is socially oppressed. She is deprived of any meaningful choice in running her own life. Oh me, the word choose. I may neither choose who I would nor refuse who I dislike. 
so is the will of the living daughter curbed by the will of a dead father. And this same lady, who is so admirable in every way, is seen by Bassanio as a source of income and the means of clearing his debts. A lady richly left, he says. To get clear of all the debts I owe, he says. And we are given three additional twists that leave no doubt as to Shakespeare's intention on the gender issue. The episode of the caskets, the rings, and the finale. Now let's reflect briefly about the significance of each of them. In the sequence of the caskets, it's essential to underline the difference between appearance and reality. It does so with some of the most famous passages in the English language. All that glistens is not gold, golden tombs do worms unfold. A theme that obviously runs through the play at several levels, the apparent civilized character of the Venetian laws, the apparent superiority of the male, all of that is just apparent. And so may the outward shows be least themselves. But the sequence of the caskets also goes further. Portia clearly is allegorically imprisoned by the structure of the patriarchal social order, just as her image is imprisoned in the casket. Here her anguish in the line, I'm locked in one of them. Now the finale recasts the triangle of the three persons with Antonio again vouching for his friend with Portia in the position of Shylock. Now such perfect symmetry is not an accident, not in the hands of so accomplished a playwright as Shakespeare. The sweaty, liberated Portia whom we see when she is disguised as the lawyer Balthazar or when she is alone with her maid is not allowed to exist in their society. Instead, she must be the obedient daughter and the submissive wife. She has to be disguised as a man to save the day in the famous court scene where she delivers her great mercy speech. How much more of a denunciation of the injustice of that could we ask from any playwright? The third dimension we discussed is the sense of responsibility. Those in power, leaders, cannot avoid the responsibilities. Shakespeare study those who strive to conquer power and the price they pay and that their societies pay for how they rise to power, such as Julius Caesar, Richard III, Henry IV, Macbeth, and once in power, how they wielded power, as in Henry V. But Shakespeare also showed a great deal of interest in those who attempt to pull back from power, to avoid the responsibilities. Those who assume power in a society have a responsibility to that society. They can neither ignore the problems and realities of their society, nor can they just walk away to enjoy the fruits of the good life without attending to the needs of their flock. In every case, he shows that leadership once assumed comes with responsibilities that cannot be simply abandoned without catastrophic consequences. Indeed, Shakespeare's fascination with those who decide to abandon power gives us an enormous range of character studies. The spoiled dreamer, Richard II, who seems to embrace his fall from the throne. Mark Antony, who prefers the love of Cleopatra to ruling the Roman Empire. Coriolanus, who cannot abide the ordinary rituals of political life. And Lear, who hopes by his own words to shake all cares and business from our age conferring them on younger strengths while we, unburdened, crawl towards death. Now, Greenblatt observes that what all of these very different characters have in common, and we could add Duke Vincenzo in Measure for Measure and Prospero in The Tempest to that group, would be that they tried to abandon their responsibilities. What can we say after all this to conclude on what Shakespeare has to say about the burdens of leadership. Let me conclude with a few reflections on the meaning of leadership and how the burdens of leadership require not only certain skills, but also certain values and ethical standards. Success in the pursuit of one's own program does not make a great leader. Leadership is more than management. Peter Drucker famously said, management is doing things right. 
leadership is doing the right things. Great leaders usually possess dazzling social intelligence, a zest for change, and above all, a vision that allows them to set their sights on the things that truly merit attention. Not a bad skill set for the rest of us either, but even the best leaders are flawed men. Witness Othello or Henry V. And this is why we want to create systems that not only allow brilliant men and women to shine, but also that can check their weaknesses and their all too human impulses. Artists have a major role to play in holding up mirrors to society and see ourselves as we really are and to open windows for us to see the world as it could be, if only we strive to make it so. Now this combination of mirrors and windows is essential in every society where the notions of identity and vision have a place. That is why the work of artists must be protected and free speech is perhaps the most precious of all the freedoms we demand as our constitutional rights. And what duties, if any, do artists have towards society in exchange for that right? What is the role of the artists such as Shakespeare in contributing to society? I think that an artist has the right to autonomy, but he or she should follow their art wherever it leads them. Shakespeare certainly did so. Bertolt Brecht, a very engaged artist, considered that those who would write the truth face difficulties. And he says, nowadays, Anyone who wishes to combat lies and ignorance and to write the truth must overcome at least five difficulties. To have the courage to write the truth when truth is everywhere opposed. The keenness to recognize truth although it is everywhere concealed. The skill to manipulate truth as a weapon. The judgment to select those in whose hands the truth will be effective and the cunning to spread the truth among such persons. Shakespeare certainly met those five conditions. Those who believe that they are responsible to mobilize and use their art for some higher political or moral purpose rather than remain faithful to their art sometimes err in defending their political convictions. And how many young idealists among the artists of the 20th century found themselves seduced by communism and ultimately excusing the horrors of Stalin. Some even denouncing friends inside the party cabals. A few who remained faithful to their art and the principle that motivated their art refused. These are worthy of a pause. It takes a special consciousness, a maturity shaped by the horrors of the 20th century, a sensitivity honed by exile, as in the case of Milan Kundera, to be able to favor loyalty to friendship over loyalty to political opinion, and to favor commitment to art over commitment to political party and to state. Even with a prideful tone of moral correctness, it does take great maturity to understand that the opinions we are arguing for is merely the hypothesis we favor, necessarily imperfect, probably transitory, which only very limited minds can declare to be an absolute certainty or truth. What can I say? Indeed, Shakespeare was anything but a very limited mind. He was true to his art, and his art is an inspiration that survives to this day. Indeed, he was not of an age, but for all time. Thank you.